let's move on um, to the next section, which is looking at uh, immunotherapy uh, and advanced stage disease. Uh, this is obviously an area where immunotherapy got its name in lung cancer. Uh, checkpoint inhibitors with uh, um, pembrolizumab, nivolumab, atezolizumab, all are, are cemented in uh, uh, stage four paradigms in the refractory setting initially. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've had more and more data uh, looking at these drugs in upfront settings, uh, both as single agents in a, in a enriched group of patients, pd one positive, and in combination of chemo. Uh, which has created a lot of enthusiasm mm -hmm. coupled with a lot of confusion. Um, so let's, let's start out with uh, the frontline data um, with a single agent pembrolizumab from the Keynote 024. And Roy, you want to talk about that? Sure. So, you know, it's funny, you know, uh, patients that were treated in some of the early phase one trials, I still remember one coming up to me and saying, Dr. Herbst, if you knew it was going to work this well, why did I have to have all that chemotherapy first? And certainly, the earlier we can bring these drugs to patients, the better. But again, for that, we want to have predictive markers to know that they work better. So the Keynote 24 trial really was historic in the fact that it took the biomarker that had been developed in the refractory setting, that being PDL1 by immunochemistry, a, a score, percentage of cells positive, uh, either looking at um, high, greater than 50%, uh, versus not. In fact, this trial only included the high patients. And it took that very select group that we knew from the phase one and the phase three in refractory disease that really had the best response rate and the best outcome and compared it to chemotherapy. Now, this was a trial that was, um, you know, you would imagine hard to accrue because only uh, by definition, you know, 20 to 25 percent of patients are going to be eligible and then all the other screenings. So we remember it was a selected trial. But in this head-to-head -head comparison of chemotherapy, and it was a dealer's choice chemotherapy versus the uh, uh, pembrolizumab, uh, the PD-1 uh, agent, uh, I believe the hazard ratio was, 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 quite, was quite good. It was like uh, uh, 0.5 uh, or, or something like that, 0.6. And um, even better, uh, the response rate was about 45%. Who would have thought we would have 45% response rate without chemotherapy? Uh, or targeted with, therapy. Or targeted <laughs> therapy. And then the PFS, I think it was the PFS that was 0.5. So this was a really amazing result. And it really um, showed that in selected patients, one could use immunotherapy without chemotherapy. And this became immediately the standard of care uh, for patients that were PDL1 high. It also uh, then brought the, the, the profiling of PDL1 to the forefront. I think probably all of us at our centers you know, want to have a PDL1 on our patients. And these data have held out. You know, when first presented at ESMO a couple of years ago, it was rather early. But now there have been subsequent uh, um, uh, uh, viewings of the data, yep. and the, the, the benefits continued. So, um, and the toxicity, uh, while different, you know, I would say the toxicity of immunotherapy, the grade three, four, are less than what you get with chemotherapy. So this this truly changed the entire landscape of how we treat lung cancer. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. They had to screen 1,900 patients to get those 300, uh, but nevertheless, uh, the, the data, as you've mentioned, is compelling. The update from World Lung shows a median overall survival of three years in those patients who are getting uh, single-agent pembrolizumab, and that is unheard of in a non-targetable population without a genetic alteration that we can act on with the targeted mm -hmm. therapy. I think I think a really important um, part of the update that I think Julie Bramer presented um, last year was that... Um, um, you know, patients who received chemotherapy were randomized to chemotherapy um, and then went on to receive PD-1 after the yeah, chemotherapy, 60, which was yeah, part of, crossover. Which right. was part yeah. of the allow, uh, what was allowed. The response rate was, was much lower mm -hmm. with pembrolizumab <laughs> post-chemotherapy yeah. and also the overall benefit was less. So I think for, for physicians that argue, well, I'm going to give chemotherapy first and give PD-1 second and I'm not going to need to PD-L1 test, I think this would really argue otherwise. These drugs are if more effective position early in, and so you really need that pdl one score up front. I think that's a really important point to emphasize about this study. And it was amazing to see that for this particular patient population, the immunotherapy was definitely better up front than in the second line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Is people, are anyone on this panel, it's a rich, enriched group of folks here, but is anyone having trouble getting PD-L1? And we need to be mindful that this is both for adeno and squamous cell patients. Mm -hmm. um, are, are we having cha I mean, challenges at all getting this done now? Uh, are there any issues? Oh, no. In fact, no. at my hospital, Yale New Haven Hospital, we can get the PD-L1 result before we get the mutational oh, yeah. tests. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the problem we have is waiting for the mutational tests to come back so mm -hmm. that we can move forward. Mm -hmm. But the PD-L1 is an immunochemistry test, and it's part of it. We, we do it up front now as a reflex, mm -hmm. and many places probably send it out as well. Yeah. But I, I think it's... It, I see this, almost everyone comes in with a PD-L1 yeah, now. Yeah. Now, which test is used is a different story, but I think the data from the ISLAC would show us that almost all the tests are the same. Yeah, just given how many, I've, I've heard from the community folks, given how many, how many genetic alterations we now need to test for, in addition to PD-L1, there may be tissue exhaustion and some problems with tissue stewardship as we begin to look at the underpinnings of the tumor. Um, we've had no problem with it. I just, I know there's some confusion out there, mm -hmm. what to do first. Roy, you mentioned PD-L1 comes first. You don't act on it until you know what the genetic alteration is. Well, in, in, in the frontline setting, I still believe that um, an EGFR mutation or an ALK mutation should trump that. Yeah. Now, that said, uh, I've been doing this almost 20 years now, I've never seen anyone cured with a targeted therapy. But still, I would usually start with that because I know the response rate is going to be upwards of 60%. Right. So I, I do want to have that. And sometimes it gets a little bit dicey. I also don't want to give an immune therapy in someone if I don't know that they're PDO1 high up front. Yeah, that's a good point. I think the point that EGFR and ALK rearranged lung cancers may not be the best candidates for immunotherapy. Mm -hmm even if they are high PD-L1 expressors is an important one. I think we're gonna have some data on this. Mm -hmm. uh, they're gonna look at immunotherapy for EGFR mutated lung cancers with PD-L1 high coming out of uh, UCLA uh, mm -hmm. in, in the next few years. Be well, very, we need to do that because yeah. I'm sure we'll talk later about what do you do when someone fails an EGFR inhibitor, yeah. and we're gonna to have to figure out how to get immunotherapy to work, whether it be checkpoint inhibitors or agents that target other aspects of the immune uh, regulatory pathways. And just, uh, I don't know if we have a lot of data on this, but the utility of pembrolizumab upfront in a pd one patient high, the utility of, of eliciting responses in the brain, have you seen that, a patient with untreated brain mass that you would use this on? Oh, absolutely, yeah. that was actually Sarah a paper yeah. that uh, Harriet Kluger and Sarah mm -hmm. Goldberg yeah. published. They had to fight at that point years ago to get the drug in an investigator-initiated setting to use it in patients with brain metastases and actually, they're about to uh, present their, their update on that, but in Lancet Oncology a few years ago, they showed that the responses in the brain were uh, consistent with the responses seen in the, in the systemic uh, disease. And that's really important because if people are gonna live for a long time, seven, eight years, you know, dare I say even be cured, you know, to avoid that radiation to the brain would be a, a very important thing. So I think now, I think some of the phase three trials are beginning to incorporate patients with treated brain metastases and so forth. Right, but I think, I think, I think that um, in general, even for PD-L1 positive patients, if they have, you know, brain lesions that are amenable to, you know, SRS, gamma knife, I am still radiating them up front um, with, you know, with, with uh, focal therapies, um, you know, because the response rate is still 45% and, and, you know, I think in general, I, I still, I don't know about you, but I'm still treating my brain mats up front. Okay, so competing strategies here. Well, it I think depends how big they are, right? Yeah. So if you've got a, right. only a couple and they're very small, remember the, the trial that we're talking about really was selective, you know. Right. In fact, when I look for good examples to show in a lecture, I can't find one because <laughs> they, they, all, all the, they all started out with very small. Yeah, right. If they're yeah. millimeters in size, yeah. but if they're centimeters in size, yeah. Yeah. Right. then it I'll makes treat more. If they're in the posterior it's, fossa. It's, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's fair to say that immunotherapy is still not at a point where it can replace local brain radiation therapy. We need to study it further, but in selected patients, like Roy said, when your need to give systemic therapy is compelling, you may go forward with it. Yeah, and I, I've, like Roy, I've seen some responses in the brain for these patients, but I agree. I think treatment decisions have to be individualized in this, in this mm -hmm. setting. Um, One thing, sometimes when they do SRS and you follow the immunotherapy, they can get that uh, cerebral edema, yeah. and, you're, and some, we've had a few of our patients do that, so the timing of doing the SRS followed by the immunotherapy can sometimes be a logistical challenge. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I was going to say there is one challenge here, and that's Jimmy Carter. <laughs> and, and, um, uh, not different sure, disease. <laughs> different disease melanoma. Not sure exactly you know, his medical record, but he got pembrolizumab <laughs> in that setting. And um, you know, everyone says, I want what he had. You know, so so we, we will see a little of that. And sure. that's because patients are very informed, and they read on the Internet, which is a good thing.